Good day, everybody. Welcome to TP Matters, the podcast series on transfer pricing matters, coincidentally enough, brought to you by PwC. I've got a number of wonderful panelists here with me today. We have Archie Romana, we have Cornelia Espost, we have Osman Malaji, and myself, Michael Bakker. We're all in the TP leadership team at PwC South Africa. Let's just quickly recap. What is transfer pricing of debt or transfer pricing on financial assistance? Essentially, what it's trying to do is talk about whether the amount of debt that a company is carrying, where it has loans from offshore group lenders, if that amount of debt is arm's length. What the thinking is, you don't want excessive debt paid out of one country to another because you get an interest deduction in the bottom country and the uh, income pickup in the top. So you don't want to denude your country, also called thin capitalization. And in that, you look at both the amount of debt, the quantum of the debt, is that excessive, are you thinly capitalized? And the interest rate, is your interest rate perhaps too high, higher than a third party would charge. You also look at guarantees and guarantee fees and how that impacts it. And really what the whole thing about nowadays is instead of the old formula driven uh, matrices, there is an arm's length principle. Is the interest rate arm's length and is the amount of debt arm's length? Now, let's talk about what we're going to be discussing. Osman, you wanted to talk a bit about this, the status of this interpretation note. Uh, th thanks, Michael. And I think my, my, my probably my main point is my hope that the interpretation note will indeed be finalized at some point soon um, and take its place as an official publication and therefore represent practice generally prevailing uh, within the SA tax landscape. I don't mind saying that the old 2013 draft interpretation of actually technically had no legal status in South Africa or in South African tax law. I always used to say the only reason it had any status was because of advice letters by people like us. Um, so we can have a separate discussion about, you know, all of the positions that have been taken in the past that relied hopefully not too heavily but to some degree on statements in the old interpretation notes um but uh, i think that the, the, the importance of this is a practice generally prevailing once it gets uh, finalized is one of the things that we look for uh, that, that we are looking for i will also michael before i hand back to you just make a point about um the question of de minimis and safe harbors i do think um i'm a little disappointed that we don't see it on the one hand it is absolutely appropriate from a you know, tax purist perspective that you don't necessarily have these um, because, you know, you want to do what is right. But the nature of transfer pricing and the nature of debt, um, certainly in terms of where we are today, when we talk about materiality and what makes commercial sense, we would have expected that, you know, there'd be some levels of de minimis when it comes to debt levels, when it comes to safe harbors for debt equity levels, etc. There's as in the previous draft interpretation note, similarly in this one, I'm still disappointed that we don't have anything uh, like that. Michael. Yeah, that would be very useful. You've got the general OECD position that you shouldn't be forced to do more work than the amount of the uh, transaction at stake, but that's very vague and people use lots of different methods to determine is something material or not, which is a yeah, probably a podcast all on its own because that materiality can be used or abused and ignored. Um, so that's that would be great if SARS did do that. It'll make real life easier. So you don't because these are complicated, expensive exercises, and really to do it for a small loan this seems crazy. Right. So there's something I wanted to talk about on this. Um, we've got a question of indirect funding. So essentially. What SARS seems to be saying in this draft interpretation note is if I've got an offshore holding company who's also the lender, it lends down to its South African uh, subsidiary. The first subsidiary in South Africa is often just a holding company. Um, underneath that, you may have a number of operating companies for various commercial reasons, sometimes for BEE reasons, 
um, you know, there can be a host of reasons why you have a structure like that. The cross-border transaction is the loan from the offshore lender to the South African holding company borrower. It then acts as a conduit and it lends the money down to the various operating companies that need it. SARS is now saying you've got to look at the cross-border transaction between the SA holding company and the offshore company, as well as you look at the borrowing position of the operating company at the bottom. Now, that operating company at the bottom is paying interest to the SA holding company who's taxed on that interest. So I don't see the sort of the loss to the fiscus or the harm here. That's the first sort of issue why I don't like that. The second issue is, you know, the holding company may have cash from all sorts of things. And the holding company may have cash from the other operating companies, from any other operations and, and sources. Who's to say the money that it lends down to another, another operating company is the money that came from offshore? How do you track that? Money is fungible. It's very hard to do this in in real life. So in theory, it sounds like SARS may have a, a, a case, but in practice, A, it's unfair because SARS is getting all their tax, and B, doing this is going to be very difficult to, to track the money. Corneli, on the, the matter of you know, sort of new things coming in, so the indirect funding came in, they also mentioned Forex. Hi, Michael. Thank you. So one of the things that's coming through in the draft I in is also that Forex also needs to be included as part of your transfer pricing of debt assessment. Now, that's quite interesting. And to take a, sort of an example for is you could potentially have an interest free loan, but it's a foreign denominated loan and you potentially have a Forex loss. If you look at the way that Section 31 is worded, um, that Forex loss, if it's not barred from being deducted because of something like Section 24I 10 Cap A, you could potentially have transfer pricing of debt issues on that. So I think it's going to be quite interesting going forward in terms of how do you overlay the Forex piece into the overall analysis. Um, and also just uh, sort of for people out there to realize that just because your loan's interest free doesn't necessarily mean that you have no problems if this new interpretation note goes through and it's a foreign denominated loan. And not only is SARS enlightened there, but our, we've got a generator kicking in and so we are enlightened here as well. We have power. And yeah, it makes it, that makes sense to me actually because the interest rates is relative to a currency. The weaker the currency, the more forex losses you, you would expect um, for the lender who's not in that currency. Correct. But the higher the interest rate would be. So the two balance out. So it wouldn't make sense that I can take out a Japanese yen loan or a Swiss franc loan with a very low interest rate and that way almost circumvent um, TP of debts. And, and I'd agree with that, Michael. I, I think it also makes sense to include it. I think it's just how you practically are going to include it is going to be interesting. Particularly because our forex for tax purposes can be deferred until the loan's realised yeah. uh, in certain circumstances. So then how does that impact? Especially because you've got no tax benefit, which is one of the exactly. one requirements. Or, or yet there may be a future benefit or loss because it depends where the currency is going. So that gets really interesting. Archie, let's bring you in. You wanted to talk a bit about one of the definitions, associated enterprises. Yes, Michael, thank you for that. So SARS, what it seems to be doing is casting the web nut wide uh, by saying that the loans, not only from connected persons, but also from associate enterprises would be part of this new regulations. Now, the thing is, nobody knows, and there's no definition around associated enterprises, nor SARS, nor OECD has had any sorts of clarification. So now for to expect the taxpayers to to test something which they did not know is going to be an interesting uh, discussion. And the thing is, how is a taxpayer going to find out what is an associate enterprise if there is no definition around it? So that's that's definitely a one big question which uh, is yet to be answered. Another thing, um, not related to this, but another thing is that this um, draft interpretation seems to be only focusing on interest expenses, meaning South Africa being a borrower. But what happens when South Africa is in a lending position, gives an interest-free loan, and because of some reason, the imputed interest becomes a tax adjustment. So perhaps a clarification is also needed in this IN is that 
what happens with the imputed interest and the deeming provision around deeming deem interest or deem dividend apologies what happens to deem dividends on the such in, uh, on imputed interest so perhaps two big clarifications which we see okay that will be very helpful um thanks archie what i think also needs potentially some clarification is SARS talks about preference shares now they in the draft interpretation note sort of indicate that you've got to delineate the transaction properly standard transfer pricing um, so when is something a loan and they indicate that preference shares could perhaps be seen as a loan presumably depending on the, the circumstances I wonder how does that work in in practice because a dividend on a preference share so the coupon the the pref div that is not deductible so if i've got a lot of debt funding into me from from overseas or i've got some well on my books it'll be debt funding because accounting purposes may see preference shares as debt so i um, have been funded with ordinary shares with preference shares and with debt if they is so saying that the preference shares could be excessive? I mean, surely not, because what are they going to disallow? The, the dividend? Well, that wasn't deducted anyway. What are they going to do? Say, oh, no, a secondary adjustment, that preference dividend is going to be regarded as a deemed dividend for TP purposes. And instead of the normal withholding tax rate to whatever the jurisdiction is, depending on the DTA, we're going to deem it to be a, a full 20%. Surely that can't be what they intend. And I'm sure the DTAs will destroy that argument. Maybe, Osman and I were chatting earlier, maybe what they're on about is saying, when you look at the quantum of debt, so how much debt can you carry, maybe they would regard preference shares there as part of your total debt amount, so you can't carry any more debt if preference... Because let's say your company can only carry 100 of debt. If I've got 100 of preference shares, does that use up my full debt amount, my arm's length amount or not? I suppose it's on a case-by-case -case basis, but my initial thought is that, well, a normal lender, and this is you know, for normal loans, which is what we're trying to, to look at here, they would rank ahead of a preference shareholder in terms of winding up, in terms of getting their interest you can only pay a, a dividend if you've got, you know, if you're solvent and liquid. So I wouldn't have thought that the lenders would regard preference shares as the same as another loan which ranks peri passu with their loans. So, you know, some clarity from SARS of what they're on about here would be, would be quite nice. The other part which where SARS have been very clear what they're on about um, is the interaction with Section 23M and Section 31. Although I don't like what they're on about, Corneli. Yes, so just to explain in a little bit more detail what Michael's referring to, SARS has indicated in the draft interpretation note that it's their view that Section 31 in the arm's length test should be applied first and only after that Section 23M or N should be applied. Now, we don't agree with that assessment, and I think linking to your earlier comments, Osman, around simplicity, um, it would really make a lot more sense for you to apply your specific sections which denies deductions um, first before you get into, into transfer pricing. Um, obviously, from a source perspective, I can see why they'd want it the other way around. Um, because under 23M, for example, you can get a carry for it, whereas um, if you have a transfer pricing adjustment, there's a deemed dividend, etc. So I can see why SARS would want it that way, but I think practically it does make more sense to do it 23M in first, and then only once you've determined the allowable amount, then only to move to Section 31. Yeah, Cornelia, can I maybe just add, add to that? And I absolutely, and I, and I do see some merit in the SARS argument that um, 31 should apply. Uh, first, I, I do think the stronger view is that 23M applies first, but I think the bottom line is um, it would have been simpler if we just had some legislative confirmation yes. so that everyone is clear. Even So even though we don't like the idea of 31 applying first, if that's the, what the SARS and National Treasury wanted, 
shouldn't be that hard for them to write it like that instead of leaving us with these debates. Correct. Absolutely. Particularly because they said they were bringing in this formula thing in 23M to make life simpler. So come on. So it makes life simpler. But if it gets more tax, rather go the much more complex route. Yeah. Okay. So I think the last thing I wanted to chat a bit about is something which SARS has mentioned, which I feel is utterly and completely ridiculous. What SARS is, seems to be saying, and I hope I'm just misreading this, because surely I pay my, my interest. And let's all agree that the amount of interest here is excessive. And let's say 100 of that interest was excessive because I had far too much debt in my company. When I pay out my interest, I very often got to pay withholding tax on interest. That's the law. So I duly go over, and every time I, my interest you know, accrues, I, I pay over my withholding tax, and SARS gets its withholding tax. Now SARS comes along and says, hang on, that amount of debt was excessive, so we're going to deny the interest deduction. Okay, that's fair enough in terms of TP of debt. SARS then says, but because any you know, adjustment we have a secondary adjustment. Um, so we denied the interest, that's the primary adjustment. And the secondary adjustment, it's a deemed dividend. So we want 20% withholding tax on that. Leaving out the fact that maybe 20% isn't the right figure and that can be argued about. Um, so as I said that we know you paid interest withholding tax first, but now we want another 20% and we're not going to give you a credit for the interest. So we want our tax twice. And we'll deny you a deduction from corporate tax. Come on, guys, that's that's hectic. Um, so I think there's strong arguments against that. I think the interesting arguments on what the, are the right rates to use as well. So don't just roll over and play dead. Come and talk to us because there are fights you can have with SARS. And we think we've got some strong technical arg technical arguments on a number of these things on the on Okay, that's all we've got time for for today. Um, thanks very much for listening, everybody, and for my fellow presenters for, for talking. Um, this is actually a voice from the future coming back to this podcast. This podcast was recorded before the Associated Enterprise Guidance was released, but we didn't re-record it. Uh, that can be discussed in a, at a separate uh, event. Thanks very much. Cheers on the rates. This podcast is brought to you by PwC. All rights are reserved. PwC refers to the South African member firm or one of its subsidiaries or even one of its affiliates and may sometimes refer to the PwC network. Each member firm is a separate legal entity. Please see www.pwc.com/structure for further details. This podcast is for general information purposes only and should not be used as a substitute for consulting with professional advisors.